All right, so for section 10.1, we're going to talk about the language of hypothesis testing. So this is just kind of getting familiar with the idea of hypothesis testing uh, and what it's going to look like. So hypothesis testing is a procedure based on sample evidence and probability used to test statements regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. So whenever we're doing a hypothesis test, uh, we're going to make a statement that is regarding the nature of the population. So we'll typically talk about the proportion, which is P, uh, the mean, so mu, or the standard deviation, sigma. And again, it's about the population, so that's the reason it's mu and sigma. Um, we're going to use evidence, so sample data, uh, that's going to be collected to test our statement. And the data is going to be analyzed to assess the plausibility of the statement. So basically, we're going to make a statement, we're going to look at the evidence, and then see if the evidence leads us to believe that our statement's correct. So these statements that we're talking about, um, we're going to actually make two statements. Uh, we're going to have the null hypothesis. So this H sub zero, it's read H naught. So H naught is a statement to be tested. The null hypothesis is assumed true until evidence indicates otherwise. In this chapter, it will be a statement regarding the value of a population parameter. So again, um, P or mu or sigma. So H naught for us is always going to be the uh, P mu or sigma, and we're going to use equals. Some books will use other symbols besides equals, like greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Um, so we'll end up using equals. And then the alternative hypothesis. So it's that H sub 1, and it's read H1, is a statement to be tested. We are trying to find evidence for the alternative hypothesis. In this chapter, will be a statement regarding the value of a population parameter. So again, the P, the mu, the sigma. The alternative hypothesis, that is actually what we're trying to prove. That's what we're trying to say the evidence is um, suggesting. So that will be our H sub 1. And we would say that, again, it's either going to be the P, the mu, or sigma. And we're going to use not equals, less than, or greater than. So these are our symbols to choose from for alternative hypothesis, or our H1. Um, in some books, you might see H sub A. So let's first just go through and set a couple of these up. So for 15... According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 11.8% of registered births in the United States in 2000 were born to teenage mothers. A sociologist believes that this percent has decreased since then. So the H1, the proportion, is what it's talking about here. So it's going to be P equals the 0 0.118. So that 11.8%. The sociologist believes that this percent has decreased. So what they think, what they're hoping to prove, is going to be our alternative hypothesis, or our H1. So we're going to go that P is less than 0 0.118. For 16, um, according to giving and volunteering in the United States 2001 edition, the mean charitable contribution per household in the United States in the year 2000 was $1,623. Our researcher believes that the level of giving has changed since then. So it's telling us that the mean charitable contribution, so mu, um, so for our H naught, we're going to have that mu equals, that's 1623. And then for H1, we know we've got mu, and we know we've got the 1623. And then the researcher believes that the level of giving has changed. So it's not specifying above or below, just different. So we're going to have not equal for our H1, or all, our alternative hypothesis. For 22, in 2000, the standard deviation SAT math score for all students taking the exam was 114. A teacher believes that due to changes in the SAT reasoning test in 2005, the standard deviation of SAT math scores will increase. So it's talking about the standard deviation. And so originally, it was equal to 114. And now, we have somebody that believes the standard deviation will increase. So thinking it's higher. So sigma is going to be greater than 114. 
So this is the process for setting up our null and alternative hypothesis, or our H0 and our H1. Now, let's talk about whenever we get things right and whenever we don't. <laughs> so whenever we have these hypotheses and we've got our null hypothesis, we're going to talk about things in terms of the null hypothesis. So we will either reject the null hypothesis or we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, I want us to think about this. So think about our court system. So we're going to assume that they're innocent until they're proven guilty. So now we go through a trial. Um, at no point is somebody at the very end of the trial declared innocent. They're either declared guilty or they're declared not guilty, but they're never declared innocent. We're never actually going to accept the null hypothesis or this H naught. We're either going to reject it or fail to reject it. So if we reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true, this is a correct decision. So if we reject this when this is true, reject it or H naught, whenever somebody was guilty, then that's correct. That's what we would hope to do. Um, our second possible outcome is that we do not reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So we fail to reject this, so we cannot prove guilt. We fail to reject this whenever this was true. So this is whenever we'd say that somebody was not guilty, and in fact they were innocent. So again, this is a correct decision. For number three, uh, our third way, uh, this is where we start to get into errors. So we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So we reject the null hypothesis, then it's rejecting this and saying that they're guilty. And whenever we do that, and, and actually they were innocent, then we're sending an innocent person to jail. That's a type 1 error. We're going to focus in on this um, as we go through and talk about alpha and beta later. And then for number 4, we do not reject the null when the alternative hypothesis is true. So we fail to reject this. So we, we're, this is saying that they're not guilty when in fact they were guilty. That's going to be a type 2 error. So again, just to summarize, a type 1 error would be putting an innocent person in jail. So the innocent person in jail means that we rejected this whenever we should not have. So rejecting the null whenever you should not and the type 2 error, letting a guilty person go free. So we fail to reject this, um, letting the guilty person go free. So we failed to reject this. We did not guilty. We determined they were not guilty when in fact they were. So of these two errors, we're going to deem a type 1 error to be worse, to be the one that we want to focus in on. All right. So here's our nice little chart. And I'm going to copy that and bring it down with us. And then this is walking through again the idea of innocent versus guilty. All right, so we're going to go through and discuss what the type 1, type 2 errors are going to be. Um, so for the teenage mothers, this was P equals our 0 0.118, and P is less than 0 0.118. So our type 1 error here, so type 1 error is concluding that we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis when in fact it's true. So a type 1 in this case would be determining um, that P is less than that 0 0.881 when in fact it's not. So determining that there is change, that it is less than that 11.8% or 0 0.881 when it is not. So when it has not decreased. Our type 2 error, so again type 2 is failing to reject um, our H0 when we should have. So this is concluding that we fail to reject, so we cannot prove that it's less. So concluding that P is not less than 
0 0.118, when in fact it is. Okay, we're going to do the same thing for our charitable contributions. So for the charitable contributions, um, we had that the mean equals that $1,623, and the researcher believing that it changed. Uh, for the alternative hypothesis, or our H1. So our type 1 error, again, is rejecting H0. So if you reject this, we're concluding that the mean has changed. So we're determining that the mean has changed, um, or does not equal, that $1,623. So it's rejecting this when actually we um, shouldn't have. So it's rejecting H0 whenever actually it was true. So it's determining the mean has changed, so that it's not equal, that $1,623, when in fact it had not changed. Or the mean was equal to $1,623. Our type 2 error here is going to be not rejecting H0. So determining that the mean has not changed. So determining that it has not changed when actually it has. So again, that type 2 error is going to be never we reject H0. Uh, and actually, we shouldn't because H1 is true. So we do not reject H0 for a type 2 error. All right, and then for 22. For 22, we're talking about standard deviation. So the uh, null hypothesis was that the standard deviation equals 114. And the alternative hypothesis, or our H1, was that standard deviation was greater than 114. So our type 1 error is going to be rejecting H0, so rejecting that it is equal, and determining or concluding that the standard deviation it has increased when in fact it has not. Our type 2 error, so type 2 is never we do not reject, so we fail to reject. Um, so, we're so if we fail to reject this, we cannot conclude that it's increased. So determining it has not increased when in fact it has. So again, that's just covering our type 1 and type 2 errors. So I mentioned alpha and beta. Alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error, and beta is the probability of making a type 2 error. We mentioned that a type 1 error would be worse. Sending an innocent person to jail would be worse than setting a guilty person free. So alpha is what we're going to focus on. And alpha is going to be our level of significance. So, And that's the probability of making a type 1 error. So level of significance and alpha and the probability of making a type 1 error are all the same. 15, 16, and 22. We're starting again that our null hypothesis, which is going to be equals, so we have 0.118. Our alternative hypothesis is that P is less than 0 0.118. And then it's asking us to figure out if, what, we, what it would mean if the null hypothesis was rejected and then if it's not. So for A, if we reject the null hypothesis, then there is evidence that leads us to believe that the proportion has decreased. So rejecting the null is saying that there is evidence to conclude that their proportion has decreased so that it is less than 0 0.118. And if we don't reject it, if we fail to reject the null, so fail to reject the null, then there is insufficient evidence to conclude that P is less than that 0 0.118. So if you fail to reject, then you simply say there is insufficient evidence to conclude something. So to talk about number 15 just a little bit more, um, because we're going through and we're talking about H1, our alternative hypothesis, where P is less than 0 0.118. Whenever we're going through and actually doing this hypothesis test, we're going to have our nice little bell curve. 
And then we're going to end up drawing a line around here. And then this is going to represent the less than 0 .0, or 0.118. We're going to go through, get a test statistic. If the test statistic falls into the shaded tail, then we are going to reject the null. If it does not fall into the shaded tail, then we're going to fail to reject the null. I'll talk about this a little bit more as we go through 16 and 22. So for 16, we were talking about mean charitable contributions. So that um, our H0 is going to be that mu equals 1623. And for H1, mu is going to be different, so not equal to 1623. So again, for our A, we're going to reject H0, and I'm going to actually kind of simplify uh, our statement here. So if we reject H0, then we're going to say there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean does not equal $1,623. And for B, if we fail to reject, it's going to sound almost identical, except we're going to say there is not sufficient evidence. So there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that mean is not equal to $1,623. So we can keep that kind of wording where we're only having to worry about if there is sufficient or if there is not sufficient evidence. Um, I also want to talk about 16 and what this would look like. So if we went and we had our nice little uh, normal curve, bell-shaped curve, if we're concluding that something's not equal, well, if it's too high or too low, we can conclude it's not equal. So this would be a two-tailed test. So we would have, we'd end up splitting that error, that alpha, into both the left and right tails. And so if we go through, and once we get our test statistic, if it falls into either shaded region, we will reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to be able to conclude what we were hoping to. And then for 22, so this is talking about the standard deviation of the SAT scores. So our null hypothesis is that the standard deviation equals 114. And our alternative hypothesis, or our H1, is that the standard deviation is greater than 114. So again, for A, if we reject H0, then we will say there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the standard deviation is greater than 114. And for B, if we fail to reject, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So again, everything we're talking about is going to be in reference to the null hypothesis. So we will either reject it or fail to reject it. And then we will be saying that there is or there is not sufficient evidence to conclude whatever the alternative hypothesis was. So if we fail to reject H0, then there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the standard deviation is greater than 114. And we're going to look at this on our nice little bell-shaped curve. So for the greater than, we're going to have a right-tailed test. So we'll end up with an area over here. And we go through and our test statistic falls in to that shaded area. Then we will reject H0. And if it falls anywhere over here, we will fail to reject H0.